Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. A big thank you to Dr. Bansi and his team for having invited me here and to share the dais with you all. This session is sponsored by AstraZeneca and actually the initial slide decks were provided to me were from AstraZeneca. They wanted to talk about innovation in the sense that you know, you're looking at the generic molecule versus the innovator molecule, which I thought is important, but perhaps not the most important thing that this audience would like to listen to. So I've taken the liberty of dividing my talk into two bits. The first bit about saving lives with SGLT2 inhibitors, and the second bit about what's the difference between the innovator molecule and the generics in terms of the science. And I thought of talking about certain things related to that. So the issue is, the topic says saving lives. So the various SGLT2 inhibitors, can they prevent death? And can they or do they prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular events? Might seem very mundane topic to you, but once upon a time in Stockholm, the Emperor study was presented at EAST. Everybody went gaga over it, saying we've now got a miracle drug of empagliflozin, which reduces all-cause mortality and CV death. And we were all surprised to see that the benefits were happening within three months of starting the drug. Never before had we seen any molecule changing outcomes in atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease within three months of starting of the drug. But what was interesting is that when you're talking about the three-point mace, the major driver of that three-point mace was cardiovascular deaths and not non-fatal MIs and non-fatal strokes, which seemed to be moving the other way as compared to the CV deaths. And the greatest benefit is that was happening was non-ACVD non deaths, because you didn't know what kind of CVD deaths you were talking about here. Whatever they be the case, they went on to apply and the FDA said that this reduces cardiovascular deaths in adults with type two diabetes. That's the label that Jardians got. And this is the algorithm that you and I see every day in every conference. And what is important is this bit, which says when AACVD predominates, use either or, it doesn't say both. It says either use a GLP-1, sorry, it went back. Either use a GLP-1 or use an SGLT2 inhibitor. That's the guideline. Now, this was a wonderful article that was published in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics about the emperor's new clothes. The caveats of the emperor egg trial that it talked about was atherosclerosis does not change in three months. You and I know that very well. And it seems that fatal events were much easier to prevent than non-fatal events, which does not follow biological plausibility. And in the Emperor Egg, for example, 40% of the deaths were presumed cardiovascular deaths. And there was no dose effect. You, whether you give 10 milligram or whether you give 25 milligram, it was same. And in your clinics, this is not the group of patients that you see. This would be maybe one in six of the diabetes patients. So if you look at Inzaki's paper in Diabetes Care, they wanted to figure out, you know, because everybody was coming out with different mechanisms of how SGLT2 inhibitors prevent death. And what they showed was the only predictor of change in mortality in Emperic trial was change in plasma volume. So it was a brilliant diuretic of sorts, which was changing hematocrit and plasma volume, leading to benefits, probably not related to atherosclerosis. So we first published one uh, meta-analysis in endocrine practice, which is the journal of AAC, because at that point of time, people started talking about, is this a molecule-specific effect? Is this a class-specific effect? And things like that. So why we did that? Because even, for example, when you're looking at a statin, you first want to normalize the values, LDL, Tipua. Uske baad, then you look at surrogate markers, atheroma volume, intimal thickness. Then you look at non-fatal events. Then you look at fatal events. And then you look at all-cause mortality. That's the hierarchy of benefit of any drug. And there was so much of heterogeneity in the RCTs that have been published with the SGLT2 inhibitors. I'm not going into the details of it for the paucity of time. But for the first time, you have a class of drugs where you can do a meta-analysis with 50,000 people. When was the last time you had a, such kind of an opportunity? So the baseline data I'll not bore you with. But to cut a long story short, we can sh show that overall, if you're looking at the SGLT2 inhibitors, there is CV mortality benefit. 
you are able to prevent cardiovascular death. And that quantum of benefit was about 15%. There were numerical differences between the individual molecules, but the p-value for interaction was non-significant, telling us, irrespective of which SGLT2 inhibitor you used, the benefit was the same. And if you're looking at all-cause mortality, the SGLT2 inhibitors prevent deaths, irrespective of which SGLT2 you were reducing. So the overall benefit of CV death and all-cause mortality is approximately about 15%, dramatic benefits. So the conclusion was SGLT2 inhibitors as a class reduce both all-cause and CV mortality, no doubt about it. Which CV events do SGLT2 inhibitors reduce? So if you look at the previous FDA guidance, because after this you now know that two years ago there's been a new FDA guidance, that people realize that you will not get benefit with one event. So you clubbed the three and you talked about the three PMAs. What were the assumptions? That in diabetes, the three major things that will happen are all related to atherosclerosis. Nobody appreciated at that point of time that how much heart failure was important, how much of arrhythmias was important, how much of sudden cardiac death was important. And we published this meta-analysis in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, which is the journal of the American Endocrine Society. And what we showed was, let us look at first myocardial infarction, whether it's fatal or non-fatal. SGLT2 inhibitors don't do anything because we looked at the data and we excluded all those sudden cardiac deaths which were unexplained. If you look at stroke, the diamond is exactly in the middle. Kuch nahi karta hai stroke mein. Now let us add all of those, fatal and non-fatal, MIs and stroke. There is no benefit. Non-fatal MI and stroke, no benefit. So SGLT2 class reduce both CV and all-cause mortality but it has got zero effect on atherosclerotic cardiovascular events. And this is the editorial that the journal published, which clearly tells us a few things. That it seems likely a plaus plausible explanation that the primary driver for SGLT2 reducing MACE may be because of optimization of heart failure and op volume status. That's the reason why you're getting the benefits within three months. And it represents an opportunity for FDA to reconsider the stratification of cardiovascular mortality analysis in clinical trials, as suggested by the authors, that in future mandates considering separating cardiovascular mortality events associated with ischemic events from those related to heart failure. So if you now come back to this, in today's world, what do we realize? If you have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you are more likely to have heart failure, arrhythmias, and sudden cardiac death. If you want to prevent those, give an SGLT2 inhibitor. If you want to prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular event, either go for a GLP-1 or go for pioglitazone. So it can't be either or. Ideally, it should be A plus B. So you've understood that, the, that this is a class of drugs which is preventing deaths, preventing events, and is a meandering path where, which tells us that future guidelines should change. So in the second half of my talk, I'll try and talk about what the sponsors actually wanted to talk about, the value of originals in saving lives in terms of you know, the innovator molecule versus a generic molecule. We are all using both, I'm sure. I am using both of them in my clinical practice, left, right, and center, whether it's the innovator and the generic. But let us look at the science behind <coughs> And is there any value in actually thinking of that the innovator might be different from the generics? And it's predominantly related to the regulatory mechanism through which approvals happen in India. So there are seven key factors for drug safety and efficacy. Those include bioequivalence, bioavailability, efficacy, safety and side effect profile, the manufacturing, the molecule and the structure, the salt and the excipients. So all of you are aware of bioequivalent <coughs> studies because that's the first step when you are producing a generic molecule that you will actually have to demonstrate that this molecule is bioequivalent. So you know, in, in a uh, standard practice of development of a drug, just look at when a patented drug goes through a, a stringent process of events, of basic science studies, early discovery, cl clinical studies, clinical mm -hmm. developments, and randomized 
control trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then getting approval and post-marketing monitoring. Whereas the shortcut of the generic drug does not necessarily go through all of these stringent processes. And there is a big difference between the originator versus the generic review process requirements as well. So if you're looking at, this is the guideline that uh, people will be following when you are getting approval for a drug. So bioequivalence limits by regulators is also something which is not necessarily equal in the world over. So if you look at in India, for example, we are looking at the drug is considered bioequivalent if compared to the innovator, your equivalence is anywhere between 80% to 125%. I'm not very sure how many of you and us, me included, are comfortable that particularly in certain cases of drugs where safety is very important, that it's plus minus 20 to 25% of what the innovator molecule is. So particularly drugs which are narrow therapeutic index drugs, the, bio, the bioequivalence limit should be much, much lower rather than what the current Indian guidelines are talking about. And there are several such situations where we know that you know, numerous studies have highlighted that when you're comparing the originals versus the generics, there is a big difference in what you're finding in the market. I think last week itself, that is this current week itself, we've had so many headlines about spurious drugs and their equivalence and the qualities. So this will probably be even more important for say something like an antiplatelet drug, right? The bioequivalence, if it varies so much, either you will have no efficacy or you'll have bleeding tendencies. What about bioavailability? Now, this is something which I read and I, I myself was not aware of, that there is a biopharmaceutical classification system of drugs. And accordingly, depending on the permeability and the solubility of the drugs, the drugs are classified. The class three drug, for example, dapagliflozin is a class three drug which has got a low permeability with a high solubility and there is no separate you know, uh, guideline that is required in India, unlike the Western world, to test such drugs. So straight away, they are treated as if it's a class one drug and approval is given. In India, class one and class three are eligible for bioequivalence, whereas the US waives only class one drugs. So actually, the generics that we are using of DAPA in India, they will actually have to prove bioequivalence studies if they were wanting to be marketed in the United States. So there are certain processes through which bioequivalences are tested, including dissolution testing of the generic drugs. And the variation in bioavailability of generics, as you can see, varies so much. This is of vitamin D. All of us are prescribing, for example, vitamin D. So it can be anywhere between minus 68 to plus 51. That's the kind of variation that you can see. What about the manufacturing processes? The most common cause of problem is that you don't have the active ingredients. The active pharmaceutical ingredients are lacking. You saw last week, talcum powder is there in paracetamol. So the major cost of the drug is in the active ingredients. So we don't know what is happening in India in a lot of these situations. Expert opinion on substandard quality, price pressures is one of the major issues. Everybody wants to be cheaper than everybody else. And as a result of which, you know, the amount of active ingredients that are put into drugs is also a major problem. Each dapagliflozin formulation is sourced from different manufacturing sites. It's not that, you know, there's only one place where everything is being bought. For example, when there was co-promotion by, say, for example, Sun Pharma for dapagliflozin, the source was the same. Here, every company has a farm somewhere, you know, a manufacturing source some other place with varying variability of standards. And polymorphism of the structure is also, which is very important, and you can't have high mu too much of variability of that either in clinical practice. So if you're looking at the molecule and the structure, 25% of available drugs are a mixture of more than one stereoisomer. So here, I'll just skip one or two slides because of the paucity of time. This is what the original innovator DAPA supposed to look like. Look at the side chain that is there in one of the generics. Just taken the picture from the box. You can see that the side chain is different. There are structural differences in the dapagliflozin that is sold in India by the different companies. 
and original dapagliflozin is there in a crystalline form. The crystalline form is more stable as compared to the amorphous form. There is again a problem with some of the manufacturers in India. This is a classic example because if there was loss of the structural changes were there with atorvastatin, this is an Italian study, I did not show that study, which showed that the efficacy of rosuvastatin and atorvastatin is dramatically different between the originator and the innovators because of the change in those slight structural changes that we are talking about. The salts and excipients are also very important because that actually results in differences in dissolution rate, solubility, stability, and a hygro hygroscopicity of the molecule. So here if you look at the DAPA salt which is there in say for SIGA, and if you look at the DAPA salt which is there in the generic, is very different. That might also lead to differences in clinical outcomes. So these are several of the other examples where you can see that the propionidol brands are not there. It's some other salt which is there. And there is variation in chemical structure ratio and molecular weight of the various generic DAPA brands which are there. You can see there's a big difference in the molecular weight of the salt which is used. If you look at for SIGA, which is the original one here, and the two generic brands that are there on the top. In terms of efficacy, the originator obviously has gone through all of that rigorous process that I talked about and including all of the RCTs that I was talking about to show that actually it leads to those benefits. Here we are, we are not sure how these drugs will actually lead to those benefits. These are all of the original publications of the originator molecule. So I think I learned a lot after having gone through the slide deck that Astra had given to me. And this is one of the studies that has been done in India to look at the analysis on patients with type 2 diabetes, with hypertension or cardiovascular conditions, taking DAPA generic versus the DAPA innovator molecule. This is a comparison of Forsiga with DAPA generics using patient data and digital analytic tools over collected symptoms and reports of patients over time. Just to see if you actually swapped over from gen innovator to generic and back, what was the difference? And the A1C reduction was different in this particular database study that was published from India. In, even in the safety profile, there is a difference between the innovator molecule and the generics that we are talking about. And also the label, look at the labels of the generics. It says you can use it up to an EGFR of 45 with the generics, whereas if you look at the original, it says you can use it up to EGFR 25. So I'm not very sure because it's probably the kind of population that the generics have actually <coughs> tested on. They've got a different label from the ones that is the innovator. And indication-wise, the generics are very, very, you know, uh, kind of shortcut, one-line indication for diabetes management, whereas the innovator has, I know it's not a insurance-based driven, comp, you know, situation in India, unlike the w American world, where the indications are also very important to have. The safety and the side effect profile, there, this is the statin data that I was trying to talk to you about, the Italian study. There's a big difference in the side effect profile generics versus innovator in the statin. And the role of generics in the eco healthcare ecosystem is very important because we are not denying the role of generics, but we have to think of all of those factors that I talked about when you're actually approving a generic molecule. So let us consider original for type 2 diabetes, heart failure, and CKD, where patience is critical. The patient trusts you, you trust the drug, and you hope for the best clinical outcome. Thank you very much.